Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. This is Andrew Stratalities with the Red Pill Religion Project. We are doing Sundays with Stratalities. Um, I'm the Master of Ceremonies on Sundays going forward, and, unless I'm absent. And today we are going to talk about proofs of God. We've got a wonderful uh, panel today. Uh, uh, and let's go ahead and do some introductions. Uh, Niffle, could you please say hi to everyone? Uh, hi there. Uh, it's me, Common Nuffle, or better yet, probably an RPG RP religion. I'll be known as uh, Cromwell. Reasons why I don't know. Thank you much. Uh, deflating atheism. Hello, Eric. Hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, Jay, or as I know him, Mind of Voltaire. Hey, guys. Let's enjoy this stream. Let's have a good one. Amen. Uh, Jean Baptiste. Hello. And finally, of course, we have Max. Hey, everybody. Good to see you here. By the way, I, we've got at least one laps Christian on here and one guy who's still searching for his spirituality. Once again, we're not a Christian apologetic show. But anyway, hi, everybody. Please come see us on redpillreligion.com. We've got stuff every day. Uh, yes, also please uh, support us both spiritually and financially. This is a hobby project for us, and anything you do to help make our lives, our jobs easier, give, gets you better content. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start with proofs of God. Um, I'm going to start probably a little bit different than what a lot of Orthodox Christians and, and deists and so on believe, uh, use as evidence, but uh, the, the evidence for God that the, and the argument I like the best is sometimes called the Reformed Epistemology position, which is basically that if you can see that God is self-evident, um, and you don't have any defeater for that, it's re reasonable to believe in God. And I think that most uh, theists, regardless of the religion, unless they've had a lot of theological training, basically have this position. They can see the truth of the sentence, there is a God. And since they can see the truth and they don't see anything in conflict with it, they're justified in believing in God and, and, and um, engaging in worship and so on and so forth. So uh, that's sort of the first uh, evidence for God is directly seeing the truth that God exists. Um, and that's where I'm starting it. Niffle, uh, how do you know there is a God? Uh, that's a good question. Um, how do I know there is a God? Well, let's see. Uh... I, I never really thought about it and never really questioned it. But when I think about how do I know there's God is that sometimes there's like strange occurrences and I feel like I might be getting much more luck. I, I, uh, that sometimes good luck just happens to me without any rational explanation. I was like, whoa. It, it's like just something that just comes unexpected. But to know there's God is probably when you look at the cosmos from a more, uh, from a like a, like when you look at it from a much higher perspective, you can see through all angles and through everything. Uh, so it's not something you could easily just find to know where there's a God because uh, God is unknown, you know? He's like the unknown unknown. That, that thing we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> and it's yet to be known. So uh, just sort of summarizing that, uh, you, you see evidence in God in both um, fortunate events that don't have any other rational explanation. And then when you look at creation or the cosmos, you also see that 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 there there's evidence or that implies a creator. Is that, that a good way to summarize that? Oh yeah. When you look at the way how the universe is organized, it's like, come on, there's no way that shit could be random. Hey, yeah. Can I comment on this? Just it's a good way to start the show too. Um, the uh, Kyler Davenport before the show, uh, he's, uh, he's from Alternative Public Radio International, and they may be carrying our stuff soon, by the way. Red Pill Religion content may be distributed by Alternative Public Radio International. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, we'll be talking to him more and getting him some stuff this week. Anyway, he was, he's still an atheist, and he's saying, well, you have to have a definition of God before you can even start this. So I'm going to go ahead and start one. And God would be the ultimate uh, uh, intelligence operating the universe. Um, and God would be the uncaused cause, the thing that starts everything, um, the beginning of all things, the end of all things. Uncreated and uncaused are part of the definition of God, okay? Uncreated, uncaused, and in charge of everything, the ultimate being. There, from there, 
we have evidence in so many fields in so many ways, it is ridiculous to continue this charade that we have no evidence, we have no proof. Unbelievable that even I'll occasionally hear religious people say that. Now, getting to the general idea of God does not mean you've gotten to Christianity. But, uh, but, but because God is, again, it's, it's philosophers understand it in various philosophical traditions, various cultural traditions, the ultimate thing running the universe, the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover, um, the thing that's making it all go. Um, that's not hard. And that's, that, that really is a definition 98% of theists would all accept, um, regardless of religious traditions. And many of them are even not religious. Quite a few people are not religious, but are still so positive there's a God. When you look for proof then, um, and stop me if I'm interrupting, but Andrew had suggested this pre-show that I bring up the near-death experience data. Um, and so before okay. we get into that, uh, Deflating Atheism has a comment. Okay. You're on mute. You're muted, sir. Yeah, we can let Max finish. I just wanted to say something pursuant to what he said about the the kind of uh, uh, presumption that there is no evidence for God. That is actually the backbone of new atheism. So I find, and I have a whole videos about this and a whole spiel about this, and I won't get into it. But when you are debating with atheists, you really uh, uh, first need to disabuse them of that of that presumption that there is no evidence for God until they are convinced that there is that there is evidence for God. So uh, yeah, evidence for God is great, but you can never be arguing from the from the assumption that that their uh, understanding is the bottleneck uh, as to whether there is evidence for God. Yeah, I mean, and that's that, that. That is the thing. The bulk of their entire movement is the claim, and it is a claim, and it is an extraordinary claim that you should demand that they answer. What they, they claim there is no evidence. Well, no, I'm sorry. That 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 is simply a lie. There is evidence. Um, uh, we have had it. I will bring a single example, but of course we have evidence in dozens and dozens and dozens of fields. This is the other thing the atheists like to do, the professionals, right? The, the, the ones who make their money at it and preach it. Um, they, they find defeaters for every piece of evidence, even though they're often weak. Let's take, for example, the work of Dr. Jeffrey Long. Um, uh, the best book to look at that summarizes the actual research from him, even though it goes back to 2010, is evidence of the afterlife, the science of near-death experiences. I have had multiple people try to tell me they find none of this credible. Um, I even challenged one person um, in the atheist collective, you know, the, the ideological atheist collective, not just the ordinary person who's a doubter or a non-believer, but, you know, these ideologues who do the shows and preach against religion challenged her, uh, you know, to read this and then deny that it is evidence. And she promptly, you know, went on with a friend of hers who's a years out of date physicist and, and some others. And they just picked apart the data um, and they were very dishonest about it. And that was when I was just, I give up and discuss with these people because they actively misrepresented what the data says and just kept making excuse after excuse after excuse for it. Um, uh, an update to that book that's more recent is God in the Afterlife, the groundbreaking new evidence of near-death experience. This is less detailed on the science. It more like adds to the original book by Jeffrey Long, Evidence for the Afterlife. The second one goes into more in point of fact since the publication of, of his original findings. They've only uh, amassed more. And you can see a great interview with him uh, on a scan channel called Skeptico called Dr. Jeffrey Long, God in the Afterlife, Science and Spirituality Collide, how they don't really collide. Um, and what it boils down to is, is that, um, and, and he shows, they show, they both talk about this in this interview. The ideological skeptics, the ideological atheists actively lie about and misrepresent the near-death experience data. Let me repeat that, that they lie about it and misrepresent it. And they would say the same thing that I would, which is that you don't, you can think of ways to excuse away this data, but it is irrefutably data. And it is irrefutably data that very smart, scientifically minded people, even people who aren't religious at all, have all looked at and said, yes, this is really strong. This is really something. Um, and so to dismiss it is not scientific. To dismiss it is, in, in fact, unscientific and irrational. 
um, and it is closed-minded in the extreme. For example, you will hear among atheists the claim that near-death experiences are very specific to people's religious beliefs growing up. Totally not true. While, uh, um, and let me, let me even get further into what this near-death experience data does. I mean, the near-death experience data is actually a challenge to Christians because it does imply that, you know, that there's a heaven and we'll, we'll get to meet a God even if we weren't religious at all in life. Um, a number of uh, atheists uh, had uh, near-death experiences and were no longer atheists. Some came relig became religious and some did not. Also, interestingly, some people who had these near-death experiences started out religious and then became non-religious, uh, but still kept the belief in God. They just Their experience made them doubt the, the religion they were in. Um, uh, they are not culturally specific, um, although they will sometimes be given images. They report that they're seeing images that like come out of biblical characters or um, meeting God as a man in a white beard, but also being like totally aware that what they were seeing was a representation to make it easier for them to understand and was not like if they met God and God was presenting as a man in a white beard. They, it was implicit even when they were talking like, okay, I know you're just showing me a man in a white beard. That's not really what you are kind of thing. But the most common near-death experience by far is not the light in the tunnel. Um, the, the, the most common by far is re, uh, uh, meeting a being that, the, oh, that they all describe as God. That is God, a being of infinite power and love that is in charge of everything. All of them, you know, that is the number one report. And it's frequently from atheists, Jews, Christians, non-religious people. Uh, it is a common, the most common, not the light in the tunnel. The second most common near-death experience, by the way, is to meet people you know to be dead. Not, and not people that you know to be alive or you th that are alive, but that, that factually are known to be dead. Um, and that, too, is most common. It, it, that's the second most common. The third is like the whole light in the tunnel thing you hear about now and then. Um, these... And furthermore, the, the reports that Long collected were collected over a period of decades. And only people who could be verified to have been brain dead were allowed in the study. Okay, so it wasn't even a heart. We, we have to be able to identify either, we have to identify brain death or out under total amnesia, uh, anesthesia, um, which anybody who understands the science of that um, means the brain has been completely shut down. There is no uh, activity in the brain, um, and these are when near-death experiences occur. They, they are remarkably uh, the same. I mean, each one is different, but mo uh, they, they have remarkably consistent reports of people going out of body, of people meeting others who are dead, of people uh, being able to travel around the hospital they're in and, and see things and then go verify the things that they had seen while they were out. Uh, of going to the other side, of meeting God, of meeting dead people. Uh, we have some uh, reports of hell that are of uh, people actually going there and like, I don't, you don't want to go there. Um, but the majority of them are not people going to hell. Um, and so it raises really serious, profound questions. However, what the atheist skeptics try to do is try to tell you that this is all electrochemical effects in the brain and dreams. If you look at the data and if you listen to the interview, uh, with Dr. Long here on skeptical, that is impossible. The idea that it is electrochemical effects is is without scientific merit. The idea that it is dreams or deluded or delusions is also without scientific merit. It does not match the pattern of any things, and they, he goes into great detail about why this cannot be so, why they cannot be dreams, and why this is completely this is much more consistent. At the, Every attempt at explain away or has been addressed and refuted. They do their best to explain it away, but they actively lie about the evidence. This near-death experience is evidence is powerful and it's irrefutable and it's undeniable that it is scientific evidence for a God and for an afterlife. It is not the only thing we have, but it is very strong and it is very telling that the atheist collective literally will misrepresent this data. Um, because they don't want it taken seriously, even though the Mayo Clinic itself is now opening up studies on NDEs because the data is so powerful. And we've got so many doctors who've had near-death experiences themselves who are in on it, on this research. Not Dr. Long here, but not, not, not Dr. Jeffrey Long here. I'm probably pushing the wrong thing. 
it, it's simply now at this point, it is complete pseudoscience to claim that you can dismiss this near-death experiences. The atheist skeptics have not come up with any rational response except arm waving and smoke. This is evidence. It is irrefutably evidence. It could be wrong somehow. There's many reasons to think it might be wrong in some sense, right? I mean, some Christians are going to look at it and say it's it's the devil lying to us because uh, most of the it seems to imply most people are going to go on to some kind of higher state of existence that's good. Um, but it's evidence, and anybody who says it's not evidence or that it's weak evidence is lying. And they should be asked to test that, you know, they should ask to prove that claim. They can't do it. And I think they know they can't. And this is only one area of contemporary science. Uh, I will add just one more recommendation and then I'll let other people talk. Another book you want to get is, is probably Five Proofs of the Existence of God by Edward Faser. This does not depend on modern science, uh, which makes it more reliable, not less in my view. Um, none of the, I, I've seen atheists claim that they have debunked the five proofs. What Professor Fazer here, who is a philosophy professor, says is that, you know, these are, these are the five classic proofs that Thomas Aquinas used. They're also not the only available proofs, by the way, but they're the five used by Aquinas, and they're all very powerful. And he said when he was himself an atheist and a philosophy teacher, he started noticing that in, in the texts that he was reading, in the philosophy texts they were reading, they were misrepresenting the classical proofs for God and, their, and, and, and then claiming they'd been defeated. So he went back to Aquinas' classical proofs, updated to modern philosophical language, and still, and then published, I'm sorry, nobody's published a, a convincing refutation of any of these proofs. So if any, I mean, you may be of the opinion that you can dismiss the argument for motion for your reasons, but I'm sorry, the, the vast majority of intelligent people who understand these think you're wrong, and you're going to have to live with the fact that people think you're wrong. This is proof. This is evidence. Anybody who says there's no evidence, anybody who says there's no proof, they're liars or they're deluded. There's evidence. You can make whatever of the evidence you want, but evidence is what this is, and that's what I have. Yeah, uh, I just want to jump in uh, about when Max said earlier is that is that often the the defeaters are very weak. Uh, you will often hear uh, quote unquote skeptics of the of the uh, afterlife uh, basically testimonies. They will point to a study that was done in the 1970s. It was one study, I believe, it was done with Air Force pilots uh, put in a centrifuge and and they and they blacked out. And they had yeah, some. Very Miller tried that too. Yeah. Yeah, they had some very vague experience. By the way, uh, try getting your hands on a hard copy of the study. It's it's like a lot of things atheists pass around. It's 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 very hard to source. But uh, they they had some vague experiences, and they say, "Oh, well, this is exactly like a, a near death experience." No, it's not. When you actually look at the data, it doesn't match up. It's only in the broadest possible reading. That they are comparable to uh, to the near death experiences someone like Jeffrey Long uh, would describe. But what I find is that when it comes to these defeaters, the uh, the quote unquote skeptics are, are the most easily satisfied people in the world. All you have to do is tell them, oh, well, there was a study somebody did sometime where you know people of all religions just had the uh, afterlife visions of their own traditions, and an atheist will hear that and say, oh, well, that just that just dismisses the whole phenomenon then. They are very easily satisfied when it comes to these defeaters. And when I was oh. yammering, was I showing the screenshots of, of uh, the and such? Uh, no, it was uh, it was your avatar. Okay, let me just make uh, sure I put them up then, just so that people can see. These are Dr. Jeffrey Long, God in the Afterlife. Find this on YouTube. Watch it all the way through carefully. Look how he describes how the atheist skeptics actively misrepresent the data because they do. Um, these are the books, by the way, you can get them on Amazon, God in the Afterlife, the groundbreaking new evidence and the original evidence of the afterlife. I recommend starting with the evidence of the afterlife because it's the one that's more scientifically rigorous. The, uh, uh, follow up, which is newer God in the afterlife merely adds to that data set and just shows how it's more, it's stronger. Um, and yeah, five proofs of God, you, you should try that. Okay. Shutting up now. Eric, uh, you're not the next step on the line uh, on the lineup. All right, awesome. Um, so I have a fairly condensed list here, so uh, my reasons will be significantly shorter than Max's. <laughs> um, so I've, I've got a list of five things here that I 
think are quite compelling pieces of evidence evidences that there is a god or a creator of some kind so firstly uh the very fact of existence itself i.e why there's something rather than nothing secondly the existence of fully sentient intelligent and moral agents i.e us human beings uh science itself coming in at number three uh what i mean by that is we have to assume the intelligibility of the universe uh to conduct scientific analysis of it in the first place yeah, yeah. um number three uh, sorry i already said number three number four uh the immense beauty intricacy and complexity of nature and from this you can you get arguments from fine-tuning arguments from contingency all types of aesthetic uh, aesthetic arguments and so on um, and number five uh, is and this is sort of take it or leave it but uh, number five is the ability for people to be uh, empathetic, which empathy I believe to be of spiritual origin due to it not being something uh, quantifiable. And finally, number six, uh, Max sort of went more into this, but yeah, near-death experiences. I would also consider those uh, a good piece of evidence. And that's, that's my list. That's why I think there is more than likely a God or some kind of creator. Yeah, makes sense to me. Um, go ahead, Cromwell. Oh, um, well, basically about the idea of the near-death experience, uh, there's also some, some stand I have a theory about this as well, that the dream world could also be another, another realm of existence, that it could probably be like a, like a reality uh, onto itself. In fact, I think when you look at it from a from an esoteric and a mystic perspective, is that the dream world is often a good way for, is often one of the places where all mages get initiated. Or, or begin their, or they start honing in their abilities, or they start growing their knowledge through the dream world. Yeah, um, if there is a spiritual dimension to life, that is strong evidence for for theism. Uh, Jay, would you like to go? Oh, uh, me, right? Okay, hey, all right. So, um, so I like to start off with a quote from Voltaire: uh, "If God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him." Okay. And so that's one of my favorite quotes that's ever been made in the history of all the philosophy, all the things that I've looked at on uh, online and in books and all of that stuff. So um, right now for me, it's a uh, it's an emotional proof or a belief in God. And so I feel like God has interacted in or intervened in my life. So. That's what I mean by, you know, emotional and it's, you know, that's that's my side. So I would share that with fellow people who are interested in the belief or, you know, or are maybe kind of weak in faith. You know what I'm saying? So I would express that to them. But for the people who are hardcore and are just atheists and, you know, they believe, you know, like, oh, there is or there is no God at all. For me personally, I listen to, and I'll tell you who I listen to and who I guide my uh, logic and my understanding. So uh, one person I would recommend is Ask Cliff. Uh, it's a very interesting fellow. I feel like he is fair. He is honest in his responses to all the uh, people he interacts with. Uh, Ask Cliff, he actually does like a, basically a Q&A form of street uh, discussions and I really learned so much from him. Uh, I feel like it's, uh, it's it's a very honest discussion, and I can be honest with people in my faith also. And so he gives good evidence for that. And some of the things that he provides is, you know, some of the typical ar arguments that you would hear, look at the fine-tuning of the universe, you know, look at all the things that exist in this world. And he answers some of those moral questions and all of that. So another person I would suggest uh, it's very a very controversial person at this time, but it's Jordan Peterson. Um, he gives a very, 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 very profound. A lot of people who do not follow what Jordan Peterson says, they just like to call it word salad. But that's just you making fun of him because you can't really follow everything that he's saying. And I really try to follow very closely to what he's saying. I'm not going to lie. Some of the words that he says 
I have to kind of look up and um you know and and really uh like find out uh like what he's talking about sometimes but he has a very unique perspective and he I I feel like he represents uh the philosophy and um and talking about God and the reason why that there is a possibility that God exists uh um some other people um I would recommend is uh Muslims uh some of these uh, Muslims brothers uh they are EOF Dawa, this would be the last group I will mention. EOF Dawa team, uh, Muhammad Hijab, um, and all those guys, I feel like they defend the belief in God pretty well. Uh, they definitely go about it in a cosmological way because they 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 address atheists directly um, in in those situations. And so they say, well, why are we here? You know, this universe couldn't have came from nothing. It's impossible. Um, so those are some of the people that I would recommend. Now, uh, getting more into my belief and how I go about defending my faith and saying that there's evidence. Well, I'm more of a person that is illogical. You know, I address people where they are. So if they have a question for me, I'll try to answer it. And I try to make sense of it, why it makes sense to believe in God. Um, so... Again, I was telling Andrew before the stream that I'm stuck really between nihilism and, you know, what Nietzsche taught, taught and um, and God. I feel like if I became an atheist, I would have to believe that there's really no reason to live this life because I'm a person that believes that this life is trivial. Uh, the material things that we have in this world is temporary. I don't believe that we came here by chance. I don't believe it is an accident at all. I think it is very serious that we take it serious. I don't think we should just throw our beliefs out the window when we don't even, you can't even answer why we're here yet. <laughs> you can attempt, you can say, well, let's look at evolution or let's look at the Big Bang, but you really don't know why you're here. And that's one of the fundamental questions for me. Because an atheist, he couldn't really come to me and tell me, well, you know, you shouldn't believe in, you know, Christianity or you shouldn't believe in a God because you can't answer outside of that. You can't tell me why I should just believe that all this means something. And so that's my perspective. And so I would definitely jump in, um, you know, into, you know, the specifics. Right now I'm reading uh, Fessers, uh, the book of the five proofs of the evidence of God. So I can become more uh, basically uh, articulate in my discussions uh, with people, because right now it's just a basic understanding. And so, you know, I, normally I just, I just listen to people talk and I try to make sense of um, what they're saying. And then if someone has something to say about it, then I, I defend it right then and there. And so, that's how I go about it, and those are some of my um, my inspiration, I would say, and, and, and how I sort of defend my faith, man. That's all I have for you guys. Right on. Uh, Jean? Uh, can I jump in here? Because it was, it was a little unclear to me what you were saying kind of towards the end there. Mm -hmm. It's like what I, what I believe you, you were saying was that when, when an atheist – uh, makes a demand of you to to uh, rationally justify your beliefs. It almost sounds to me like you were saying you you can't have that compulsion to provide a rational explanation for something under materialism. Is that is that kind of what you were saying? Um, mm, ask your question a little bit differently because I'm not I'm not really understanding. Oh, okay, okay. It's 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 like when when they when they when they assert that you must have a. Uh, uh, that your your beliefs must be rationally justified under pure materialism. Uh, that there's no there's no you know, everything is just uh, determined. There is no rationality. There is no reason. So it it's almost it almost sounds like kind of a, a, a you know the presuppositional argument that by by you know declaring the necessity of reason, you're already you're already dispelling uh, materialism, as it were. Oh, so also you're addressing my my idea that materialism, like finding purpose in life, is that what? You're yeah, saying? yeah. Okay. Well, for me personally, um, I, hopefully I can re-explain it well enough for you. But for me personally, 
I look at the material world as something that's very trivial, right? So let yeah. me look up what trivial means and so I can, because I, I know I have an idea, but I just want to make sure I'm correct, right? Okay. So, um, so of, of little value or importance. So thinking of things like uh, the material world, thinking of things like clothes, um, um, you're looking at cars, you're looking at shoes, you're looking at people even in, in these jobs that we have around us in this world. This is all a, a made up system. You see what I'm saying? For us to survive in. But outside of that, when we die, we can't take none of those things with yeah. us. So it doesn't really matter to me. You know what I mean? Ultimately, on an ultimate level, yes, I'm living in this life, but when I die, it doesn't matter anymore. And so really, if I die, there really wasn't any purpose if if I'm not, you know, a believer. You know what I'm saying? It really wasn't any purpose for it besides, you know, basically living to die. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. how I look at it. And, and so when the atheist demands that, you know, you, you, you research, you know, evolution, the Big Bang, you say, yeah, that's all well and good. But in the big scheme of things, it doesn't matter unless I know these things were designed by a loving God that mm -hmm. kind of imbues them with, with a whole new significance and makes them worthy of study. Right. Exactly. That's how I look at it. Yep. That's actually really profound. Um, John, you've had your hand up for a while. Well, my definition of, of God is, is, is as you know, I do agree with Max that pure being, um, pure, a uh, being of pure thought, pure spirit that, um, makes everything go. And I'm going to add on to that because I think that God has a personality, you know, um, making God personal God. And uh, I don't mean personal God, like, you know, that is, you know, God is my own personal God, but he has personality. It, it, he comes around and every once in a while he'll, 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 uh, he'll answer prayer. But the way, the way that God answers prayers are, are, are significantly different than what we think. Cause whenever somebody prays for God, you know, for physical things, that's kind of, that is, I don't. I wouldn't think that's something that God would actually um, respond to at all. Because what what do you you know when when you as a person you with a a being with personality, if somebody was to come up to you and just man things of you, you just you just ignore them, and you know. So I kind of one of the proofs proofs of of God that I have that this being exists is prayer. Um, my experiences with prayer, there, there are times when I would sit down and I, every once in a while I still do, I sit down and, and I pray what is next. And a thought comes into my head that I don't think I thought that, that are like instructions. It, it's, it's weird to explain it. Um, the, it, it, it's, you know, your own thoughts. And, you know, you know when there's thoughts that aren't yours. It sounds really crazy, but that's the best way I can explain it. Um, yeah, and, and actually a theme that I've noticed all here, I'll just comment and, and then let Max have the floor, but that a lot of us actually have a relationship with God in our lives through experience in personal, through prayer and action. And the, the, that type of relationship is impossible to have with someone who does not exist. And so the, the question of God's existence is sort of in our rear view mirror because we're in relationship to God in our lives. And, and the, the question isn't their existence as, anymore. Go ahead, Max. Hey, oh. If if Max doesn't say nothing in the next minute, I want I want to say something. Go ahead. I see that I see that um, Sir McIntosh in the comments is saying, "I am open to the supernatural." Is problem is that the only evidence exists is natural. I don't quite know what you're meaning there, but let let's go over this again. Any claim that we have no evidence of God is false on its face. 
any claim we have no evidence of the supernatural is also false on its face. Now, if you want to start talking about the supernatural in a rational, logical manner, um, uh, you do what has been understood for thousands of years, and this is not new. This is not some trickery, not some anything. These are very standard definitions you can look up in philosophy dictionaries and otherwise. The natural is that which is subject to the laws of physics. It, the natural it responds to gravity, you know, heat, uh, light, electromagnetics, the electro, um, um, <clears throat> strong and weak nuclear forces, etc. The supernatural is everything that is not that is not subject to them. Um, <clears throat> in fact, one of the first uh, evidences of the supernatural you have is the laws of physics themselves. Um, the law of gra laws of gravitation, for example, are not subject themselves to themselves. Um, so uh, gravity, uh, gravity, uh, which is non-material, by the way, you cannot point me to gravity. Show me the gravity. You cannot do it. Um, gravity is one of those things that's supernatural. Other things that are supernatural include logic itself, mathematics, geometry, and by the way, things like, uh, and, and by the way, we have lots of evidence that um, there are intelligences, plural, running around um, that are not subject to the laws of physics or only interact with the laws of physics briefly. We even have copious evidence in current contemporary science beyond the near-death experience data. We have evidence in contemporary science, in neurobiology, that your mind cannot possibly be explained as a process of electrochemical effects uh, or as an outgrowth of electrochemical effects. Um, um, in fact, contrary to what they keep saying is that we're getting closer all the time, actually, the more we learn about how the brain works, the more we know it's impossible to explain it electrochemically. And we have evidence that that's because you have what some would call a soul, that a good part, of, that a good bit of your mind is not subject to the laws of physics. It is outside or beyond or transcending physics, but is interacting with your brain. If you look into something called the uh, neural binding problem, the cognitive binding problem, um, or what they just call the hard problem in neuroscience, you will find that the more we have learned, the more mysterious and weird your, your consciousness is, your awareness, your will. Um, Daniel Dennett, by and large, just makes gross statements about it that he can't back up. In fact, I'll, I'll give you the videos. I'll give you references to stuff. There's plenty of working scientists who will tell you, no, you have to have something like a soul for anything going on in your brain and even your body to matter that your whole central nervous system appears to be communicating with something that is beyond the laws of physics and is not physical. The claim that you can get it all down to physical is actually easily debunked. You cannot, not with the best science today. So anybody who says you can get it down to the physical is just merely making a faith proposition. In fact, we have reason to believe that you have a supernatural soul, supernatural, i.e. not bound to the laws of nature. There's lots of things that aren't bound to the laws of nature. And once you get past that, really, I will, I, really, if you think everything is subject to natural forces, like the scientific naturalists would have us believe, um, uh, you have to believe there is nothing beyond the material. You are by default a materialist. And let me tell you, when you study what materialism is and when you really finally understand it, you realize it's illogical. It is not possible that everything is subject to the laws of physics. It is not possible that everything is an outgrowth of physical processes. That cannot be demonstrated. That is not a, a, a rational belief. I mean, I guess it's kind of rational, but it's certainly not a scientific belief. It's not a, it's not a proven it, belief. It, it, it's just it's a belief. It's self-defeating because the laws of physics it's, themselves can't be uh, subject to the laws of physics. Right. Hey. Real quick, and let, I got a dilemma for you, Charlie Reed and Sir, Sir McIntosh, because I'm reading the uh, I'm reading the chat, and so you uh, I read that one of you guys said that um, you know prove that there's a soul or whatever that is. So I have a dilemma for you, right? Uh, me and my friend we had a conversation one time about colors, right? This is as real as it gets, all right. I have not introduced this to Andrew, but Andrew here I'm going to reveal it to you today, right? So listen, colors, awesome. right? Everyone knows all the colors in the world. Red, blue, green, pink, right? You know what I'm saying? Dark blue, navy blue, whatever the case may be. But there's a dilemma here. We have evidence for colors. We can measure it. We, we can know exactly what color exists out there. But you know one thing that we cannot prove in a lot of people? 
They might they might disagree with me on this, but we cannot prove that we see the same exact colors. I don't know. No. I it, don't know if you're if, like what you know is red. I don't know if you see it as blue. You see yeah, can I point too? can I point something out here and jump in on you? I don't want to step on you because what you're saying is absolutely correct. The 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 materialists who really are indoctrinated in a way of thinking that it makes no sense at all will try will, will immediately start giving you a song and dance about how no we know the light frequencies of this this of, of this frequency go into the eye and go through the neural system into the brain and get interpreted as red they are completely missing the point that you have no explanation for your perception of the color red at all mm -hmm. um, furthermore like I said something what I call the, the the neural binding problem you've got all this data coming in. Um, and we know, okay, this kind of data goes into this part of the brain, and this kind of data goes into this part of the brain. It's been known for centuries, and it's still too true circa right now in 2018, that there's no explanation for where all that gets tied together into a singular perception that is your awareness. No explanation for that whatsoever in contemporary science, no evidence at all that you could possibly get it down to electrochemistry. It is evidence that you have to have something like a soul that is beyond the laws of physics. This is centuries old evidence that contemporary science is often finding quite a bit of evidence for. Like, by the way, since I noticed some commenters came in late, go back and review everything we said about the near-death experience data, which we can show um, so-called skeptics lie about. Um, we're not gonna go over it again, but you've been given the references. Go look at Jeff, Dr. Jeffrey Long's work. Anyway. Yeah. So, well, well uh, uh, in, in theory of mind, uh, uh, the experience of the color red is what, what is known as a, a qualia, or that's actually the, the plural term. I don't know what this yeah, is. Yeah, qualia, yeah. Mm -hmm. Qualia. And so uh, Daniel Dennett, the, the committed doctrinaire uh, materialist he is, uh, he asserts that it doesn't exist. And where, the, where his uh, materialism butts headlong into uh, what's also known as the hard problem of consciousness, uh, he basically takes his ball and goes home. Uh, he just declares that there is no such thing as consciousness. So that's he. He does. Yeah. 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 What they think to do that? They think consciousness is an illusion, and they'll tell oh. you so. Yes. Daniel, which is an Daniel. illogical position. But just give me a little uh, uh, clearance here. So yeah. So uh, they he, he's basically abandoned his materialist quest to uh, explain consciousness by simply decreeing that consciousness does not exist. Now, uh, going back to what uh, Max was saying is that uh, the whole paradigm, and I think it's, it's very popular in, in the public imagination, although it's all but abandoned in theory of mind, uh, is that the brain is kind of like a computer, okay? <laughs> that's that's given up the ghost. And I'm going to uh, give some citations here, and I could, I could send it to you after the chat so you could link it in the low bar. But I can give you articles, these are not, from theologians these are not even from philosophers these are from scientists and they're explaining the computer paradigm does not work and one is an article on eon it's from uh, robert epstein a senior research uh, psychologist at the american institute for behavioral research and technology in california and it's called the empty brain you this is the this is the sub headline of the article your brain does not process information retrieve knowledge or store memories in short, your brain is not a computer, okay? That's from a, a research psychologist. And also, an article from Wired. Now, I'm sure uh, Max can give you a whole spiel about this. Wired is a magazine that has a long history of, of, of basically propagating atheist propaganda. Oh, but absolutely. It, it even has, an, even Wired has an article that says, since the brain's not a computer, what is it? So they've given up the whole notion that the brain operates with Oh, no, and this is a pattern that that's centuries old, actually, that every every century, man has attempted to explain the human mind in terms of an analogy of the greatest technology. In the Victorian era, the analogy was a steam engine, and mm -hmm. the human mind is like a steam engine, right? Or, and, and so on and so forth, you know, in the early, early 20th century, it's like, it's electronics, or it's analog electronics, or something like that. So, yeah, that, that, that's just total BS. Um, uh, Jay, did, did, did you have anything to, to finish? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, I wanted to add to that. And so, basically, you know, um, and, you know, about quality, I actually didn't know to that extent that that's how, how far he went. But um, but just me researching colors, 
um, it really was interesting to me that really there's no way in hell that you could really prove that we see the same color. And that's my point. And what and the question behind that is, what is evidence? Because it's really about what you believe to be true, because there's no way you can manifest to me that we see the exact same colors. You can only just speculate because we all been taught these things. This is a taught. This is something that we've been taught since we were kids. So we don't really know anything. We just know that what we see is red. However, outside of this conversation, I mean, honestly, we were just, you know, diving in deep thought here. So to, to be frank with you, but I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, man, I don't know, guys. Uh, you know, I might joke around with you and be like, I don't know. Um, I don't think we might be seeing the same red. Traditionally, we just believe red to be red, but we don't really know. So and and so that's the thing here. You know, evidence is not always just cut and dry. Sometimes the evidence leads to some other questions that we might have. Yeah. And another, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, 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 and then one of the ways out of it actually is, you know, if our minds were designed by a benevolent God to be able to grasp truth, then we can actually say, well, our minds, you know, both you and my minds are working properly and, and we're not being tricked by a magician and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And so the, the red that I see is the same red that you see because we know that God has made us in his image and we're both humans and have that, that relation to truth. I agree. I agree 100. And, and another, I, I think it was John Baptiste. I saw in the chat, uh, chat earlier, he mentioned abstract numbers. <laughs> numbers are in your mind, everyone. I hope, I hope you guys knew that. It's nothing physical. Just because you bring out two apples doesn't mean... <laughs> Let me <point> out to <laughs> that, that is a Classically, uh, let me point out to you that classically mathematics would be would have been considered the realm of the supernatural, just as logic itself. Reality follow, obeys math. Math does not obey real. Uh, um, physical reality obeys mathematical rules. Uh, math doesn't obey physical rules at all. You cannot point me to two anywhere in the universe. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And, and, that, true. And, and that is not something we impose with our brains on the universe, I don't think. If you think that, then you think we're imposing all reality on the universe, and that makes no sense. And unless unless you're a chaos magic, unless you're a chaos or a chaos magician. <laughs> uh, so, uh, JMD <laughs> apologist has, has made it in. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm a little late. Um, so are we just talking about the mind-body problem right now, or did we talk about other arguments for the existence of God? Uh, yeah, so basically what we've been doing is talking about our favorite proofs or evidence for God, um, and it, it's uh, sort of we gone down this about, trail. We wandered down the, the, the issue of the, the physics-independent mind, i.e. the soul, because, I mean, you can believe there's no God, but still think there's a supernatural soul or that there's an afterlife. You can. I, I, I think if you think too hard about it, that's hard to justify, but you can believe there's something like a soul, and that does not necessarily mean you, that there's a God per se. That's a really weird uh, world view though, right? So basically you end up having this spirit-filled, a supernatural world with no, th nothing grounding it, basically. Uh, and yes, I, I agree that is weird, but just because it's weird does not mean it is common. Uh, I found in my experience that there are very few true materialists, even among professing atheists, there are very few true materialists who will not say something when, when a loved one dies that they're somewhere else or does not believe in at least something like, like a, a star signs or something. You will find that's in my experience. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, and, and death and another thing, just to kind of kind of veer off a little bit, death is unique to me. Um, I, I just find it weird that we find like it's in, emotional when we lose something and, and and it's so unexplainable to me. But JMD, I'm gonna pass it to you. I don't want to be rude. I just, I just want to throw that thought in there. Go ahead. Well, I think for arguing for the existence of God, you have two main approaches. I think um, typically the presuppositionalist approach, which would be the tag argument, or from Van Til, or basically you argue that God, the preconditions for intelligibility would be God, because on you know scientific naturalism, you have a problem with epistemology. How do you get mind from matter essentially? 
and of course, um, a mental state or our beliefs. And uh, you could omit property dualism, which is basically uh, mental states arise from brain states, which I would have to ask how, but I could just grant that. And I would have to ask, how do you come to any objective truth claim? Because what you're dealing with is um, truth is dependent on your belief and your belief is dependent on the arrangement of molecules and how your brain is mat, you know, uh, added up because your mental states arise from that matter and so on. So we all have different beliefs. I, what I call it is materialistic relativism. And at this point you're dealing with, um, relativism just in the material sense, how I described before, and you can't get any truth or epistemology from there from that. So knowledge itself is gone. So I think you have to have a soul. And ultimately I would argue that, um, for the soul to have freedom of the will and so on, you would have to have a soul maker, in this case, God. Or you can take the evidentialist approach, which I typically take, or a classical apologist approach, where you can argue and deductive arguments for the existence of God, you know, um, the Kalam, contingency, fine-tuning, moral argument, all these, uh, even the ontological argument, and I typically go that route. I would say my favorite argument is the fine-tuning argument, because um, some of the responses to them I find to be very weak and very um what's the word i should use here desperate attempts to try and avoid the inevitable from the conclusion any thoughts uh, um, I actually, my uh, hands up my hands up so i'll i'll jump in i think i i, I actually find the argument from intelligibility which is and 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 fine-tuning both quite compelling um like i said um but something i want to point out is that uh, I think actually psychological proofs have some value. You know, I personally, uh, it was in studying evolutionary psychology, I realized that uh, a belief in some kind of God, some kind of afterlife was absolutely universal in humans, except for a distinctly identifiable minority. What shocked me a few years, and, and that made me think, all right, maybe I'm the one who's wrong. Then I had a lot of negative experiences with my fellow atheists who are incredibly rude and abusive uh, over a number of issues. By the way, if you hang out in atheist land long enough, you'll figure out that's common. Well, I, you, you look at this book by research psychologist Paul C. Vitz, Faith of the Fatherless. Even if you're an atheist, you ought to look at this, okay? Because if you're an atheist, you're a distinct minority and you're a shrinking minority. In fact, one of the things that we, I mean, that is true globally, but that is true in the United States and Europe. That is true in all these secular uh, havens that you hear about. Atheism is dying off all over Europe, and religion is making a major comeback. If it's not going to be Islam, it's going to be Christianity or some kind of paganism, because uh, Europe is a very religious continent, it turns out. So listen up. When you look at the faith of the fatherless, atheists are a distinct minority. Um, getting back to my c conclusion, by the way, which is that we had to have evolved to have a sense of the spiritual, the supernatural, and the belief in some kind of God is so universal in humans, uh, those who do not believe there is any kind of God are a distinct minority and always have been and still are and a shrinking minority. So let's face something. Why would we evolve a sense for something that isn't there? Why would we evolve a delusion? Furthermore, when we look at atheists themselves, since atheism has become so popular, we can now, you know, uh, do psychological s studies and surveys of atheists. And one of the things we will find out is more than nine out of ten atheists are male, um, which, you know, some will like to say, well, that's because the male mind is more logical. But no, you're, you're a minority among males. Um, uh, uh, and they're almost all men, with a few exceptions, greater than 90 percent male. And greater than 90% of them come from broken families and have terrible relationships with their fathers. It looks that in most cases, there's all a hysterical reaction against the father figure is a, is a psychology that un, un, lurks underneath most atheists. We have good reason to think that it is a psychological malady because seriously, you don't have to come to Christ or any of that or join any religion. This hysterical denial that there is reason to think there's a God in an afterlife is just that, hysterical denial. There is evidence for these things. It is rational to think these things. Most of you who are atheists, and by the way, I was an atheist for decades. This fits my profile really bad, broken, fun dysfunctional family, really crap father figures in my life. Um, um, uh, and I was, I, I never perceived it quite this way, but I mean, it's undeniable. And every former atheist I've talked to has admitted, yes, they came up in a weird family background. Uh, well, no, those who were raised, uh, like Cy Gart was like raised 
almost every other atheist I've talked to, male and female, the rare, the females exist. They're rare, broken homes, bad bad dads or no dads. It's, and that all by itself is evidence of God. It's also useful to know, by the way, if you're doing work talking with atheists to realize that they almost all have father issues. And the father issues, how father issues manifest, uh, let's see, uh, because they didn't have a dad to set boundaries for them, um, they, tr they, they, they try desperately. They're always testing uh, authority figures constantly, um, looking for the pushback they never got from a good father to put them in the right place. They tend to have a chip on their shoulders in a big way, be very snotty, rude, and condescending, or very introspective and moody and tend to stay away and isolate from people, one or the other. Um, uh, uh, psychologically, people with father issues, especially men with father issues, tend to have anger issues or deep anxiety issues, uh, deep insecurities. They tend toward narcissism. And if you look up narcissistic personality disorder, narcissistic personality traits run extremely high in those with father, father issues. Um, basically, we could, this whole book is fascinating because you can see in the online atheist collective and their group behavior, the, you know, the chip on the shoulder, the superiority complex, the narcissism, the constant need for attention, the constant need to put down others, the constant need to dismiss any idea that they don't already believe in or approve of. These are the psychological traits of people with daddy issues. I'm sorry, but they are. And this is just a scientific analysis. And what that should tell you is, is that if, hmm, if, if it's universal in humans to believe in something like this, I should at least recognize that I'm the oddball here and maybe I should rethink instead of assuming myself superior to all my fellow human beings mentally. Consider that. Um, that would be the main thing I would ask, because really one of the reasons I left atheism was I noticed how nasty atheists were in groups. And that was more than 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and, and, and to, to tie it to sort of proofs of God, right? If something is true, it should bring about good outcomes and have good fruits, right? If yep. you're... If, and I see deflating atheism, uh, uh, sort of not liking that pragmatic definition. But, but uh, put, to put it a different way, falsehood leads to bad things, and and if atheism leads to bad things, that's at least mild evidence that it's false. Um, we've got about two minutes. Does anyone have closing uh, comments? If, you've, uh, uh, if, you, if so, just uh, raise your hand in the chat. I'm going to sh uh, share one thing. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, go ahead, Jean Baptiste. All right. Um, my closing thoughts. Uh, scientific truth is nested and philosophical truth like this everything that we that we know mathematics science um everything comes from philosophy and philosophy has had a a huge impact and still does has have a huge impact on science um and it, it's not exactly a a um it's not exactly a a argument that I've actually explored recently, but the Klom argument is fair from a psych, uh, not a psychological, but from a um, philosophical perspective is a valid proof of God. Um, and it, it, yeah. Cause there's, there's things about our thoughts that um, we can't really, explain just by using brain chemistry and gen and genes and whatnot you know that there's we have seen in science that we have these little micro teals in our brains we don't know what they 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 are but they look like little wi-fi um antenna and, and it, there's just so much that we don't know you know, through science or through uh, philosophy that, you know, just the act of being able to think because we 
didn't we didn't just um, you know come up with the ability to think it it came from somewhere and yeah that's my closing thoughts awesome uh rob go ahead rob me okay i guess i'm the only one here uh yeah i, I think there's there's a, a an important uh distinction uh that needs to be made here uh and and the you know between what is our quote unquote favorite proof of god uh, and what we may find convincing versus what we would use, uh, what we would tell an atheist uh, to get them to believe. And those are not necessarily the same things. So, uh, like, if, if I were to try to convince an atheist, like, I'm, I'm a big fans of, of the, of the uh, five ways, of Aquinas' five ways. Uh, <laughs> I would never try that on a neophyte atheist. I would probably lead off with something like, you know, the fine tuning of the universe or maybe a, a more kind of intuitive correlate of, of the Kalam. Uh, but it, it depends. It's different for everyone because I think there was some member of the red pill religion team or something. They said what, what convinced them to be a Christian. I think what convinced them from atheism to be a Christian was the, uh, uh, the fulfillment of prophecies in the old Testament. So you never know what it's going to be. But like, what is what is a strong argument for God is not necessarily what is a persuasive argument for God to uh, uh, maybe a person who just, who's not coming from a you know uh, who's not very philosophically literate. So I would never lead off with any formulation of, of the ontological argument. You know, I, I would probably start out with with you know a, a cos some sort of uh, fine tuning or something like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And um, honestly, for for a lot of believers, be they Christian or, or other things, that the they're the thing that turns them around could be an experience, right? Like like even experiencing in God during like divine liturgy or something. Yeah. By the way, I also just want to uh, make a shout out because nobody's mentioned this all. Uh, the 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 uh, evidence for the for the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ is really compelling and really worth looking into, and that is specifically for Christian theism. So we need to mention that. Awesome, uh, JMD. Do you want to go? Yeah, just real quick. You know, uh, Sir McIntosh, his his refutation of the fine tuning and Kalam debunked and debunked. Okay, I guess we can't use those anymore. But uh, aside from that, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, that's probably a joke. But um, aside from that, I think that this is probably a late thought, which should have probably been at the beginning of the video. I don't know if it was or not, but you know, what do you mean by God? And if you mean a, a sky daddy, then obviously no philosophical argument will convince you of that because those arguments don't argue for that God. So as uh, me and deflating atheism always say, I don't believe in that God either. So first you have to, I always ask them, what do you mean by God and what would convince you? And if they came to find God correctly and they don't know what would convince them, then they're not atheist or agnostic because to be unconvinced of something, you have to know what you're unconvinced of and why you're unconvinced of it and what could convince you. So I go from there, and then when they tell me where they're coming from, I, I sort of go with the argument from there. Yeah, that seems perfect to me. Um, next up is Eric. Yeah, so my closing thoughts would be more so a uh, recommendation oh, for... Oh, your mic, brother. Oh, can you guys hear me? I guess go ahead and try. Lean in or something. How about now? Got a lot of background noise. Just go ahead. No, hang on. I think he's got the wrong mic selected. It sounds like we hear his chair creaking. Yeah. Probably. Anyone else have closing thoughts? How about now? Uh, about mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. uh, closing thoughts. Let's see. Um, you know, there are times when uh, the odds are heavily stacked up against you, but sometimes you just got to buckle up, take a lot, grab life by the balls, and just uh, handle your business and pretty much uh, walk, walk tall in the end. Yeah. Right. Um, also, uh, Eric, are you good? We, st we still hear your background. It's not that good. Is it my mic? 
Yeah, it it's sounds like you've got the wrong mic selected and like we're picking up your PC condenser mic or something. Just huge noise. We'll have to get to the time, Eric. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, yeah, my closing remarks is uh, one of my <laughs> – this is an old quote here. I just wanted to kind of make a quote and then say something. But uh, the atheist can't find God for the same reason that a thief can't find a policeman. <laughs> I like that quote. I don't know why. Anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> I to end it off on silly though. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, uh, I just hope you guys keep searching. Um, don't ever stop talking to us because the more you talk, you know about it the more you'll think about it and hopefully the seeds we planted and uh you you'll learn something about it um you know because really i believe that people that come to grips with christianity have to find it on their own you know you can get help you know and you can go look read some books and look at some videos or whatever but you know there are some atheists that just like to just compel people so um, and, and that's okay. You know, they're not going to compel me. They're not a vampire or anything like that. So it's not going to work, but, um, hopefully, you know, I don't want to be that arrogant. You know, you never know where I'm going to be in 40 years, but I, I feel like my faith is strong. Um, and you know, everyone in here keep on fighting a good fight. Amen to that. Um, I just add one final note. I'm going to say it again. Go read this book, Faith of the Fatherless. You should all read it. But especially an atheist, you're going to see yourself. More than nine out of ten of you are fatherless males. And, and the few of you who are female have the same problem. You're mad at your dads in most cases. That's it. Okay. Um, I think that's it, unless Eric has his mic working. Is it any better or work? It's it. It. Just do it, man. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, just a recommendation just for people in general to take a mental note of. Um, be aware of the cultural aspect of people's uh, unbelief um, because I think given that we live in the Western world, uh, we're, we're a very hyper-materialistic culture and I do believe that is, uh, that is the spiritual detriment, honestly. So just be conscious of that fact. Yeah, uh, definitely. We yeah, definitely we are in a hyper materialistic culture, and I get the feeling that um, if Iguero said that either uh, either the uh, materialistic culture would uh, overshadow the spiritual, or 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 it will like, or it will sort of slowly uh bury it. Ultimately, the uh, the the spiritual will slowly make a resurgence. Uh, what happens in the end is ultimately only time will tell. Yep, um, and we will let JMD put give our final thought and then end the broadcast. Yeah, I don't know if this distinction was made, but I think an important distinction has to be proof and evidence. I think proof is absolute certainty, and then evidence is most likely the case. A logical argument that's valid and sound is a proof. Then induction, by definition, would be an evidence. So I, I, I just think that's one more distinction that needs to be made. So when natural theology ar argues for God, a deductive argument, when they say that arguments aren't evidence, they're actually wrong. Actually, they're correct. Deductive arguments are proofs, not evidence. And inductive arguments are evidences. So that's the last thing I, I think is important here. Uh, okay. Well, everyone have a wonderful day, and I will see you in a week at most. And God bless.